Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, those who are watching online or will be watching perhaps uh, some uh, time later, it's good to be together, isn't it? Do turn with me to the passage we had read to us by Adam a little earlier, which was James and chapter 3. And that's page 1214 if you have a church Bible. I want to ask you a question. This will actually rather sort out uh, our generations, really. Um, and I suspect most of us won't know the answer to this. Um, who sang this song? Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. Well... Any ideas? No? I'm amazed. No, I'm not actually at all. Um, it was Noel Coward. And you perhaps will have known of him, although he's a bit of a generation back, really. Um, I wondered whether to bring that to you this morning, but I thought I would, because it just displays the rubbish that goes around in my mind. How do I know that song? I mean, that's the question, isn't it? I have no idea, but I didn't have to look it up. It was rattling away in my mind. And when I was in Bromley, of course, I was looking after youngsters over music uh, and them playing musical instruments. And, of course, our job, and we met many of my older colleagues or my past colleagues uh, just yesterday, our job was to give the youngsters, the biggest thrill to play music and to enjoy music and to love it. The downside of that was that the one bit I dreaded was when a youngster would come to me in my office and say, uh, Mr. Mawson, they were quite polite most of the time, to my hearing anyway, um, I've decided I want to be a musician. That's what I want to give my life to. And why that was a downer for me was because I would then sit down and say, don't do it. Don't go into music. Whatever you do, go be a brain surgeon or an architect or something, um, but don't do music because it's such a tough life and it, it, the rewards are not great for most. And that was hard, really. And in a sense, that's what we have this morning. Right at the very beginning of our passage, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So that's where we start this morning. Don't become a teacher in the church if you can help it. And the reason is, of course, that those of us who teach or preach in the church have a huge responsibility to be uh, precise and accurate according to the gospel. And James says clearly, those of us who have that responsibility and privilege will be judged more harshly than those who don't teach and preach. The verse that really matters to me, that it sort of helps me to understand James and gives us a basis for what we're doing, is if you remember in chapter 1 and verse 18, he, that is God, chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. That to me is a seminal verse. And the reason it's the seminal verse is because it tells us that we are new people in Jesus Christ. We have been born anew by the power of the Spirit. And so uh, as those who are in Christ and love Christ and serve Christ, as we've been hearing in all and singing in all our songs this morning, that is the basis for the letter of James. If we are not those people, if we do not belong to Christ, if we have not been born again, if we are not new people, resurrection people as it were, then the letter of James is a meaningless letter, to be honest. It, it's, it's a nonsense to us. But if we do belong to Christ, then suddenly the letter of James becomes more and more precise and more and more relevant. Now thinking about chapter 3, I was thinking to myself, how... Where's the main verse in chapter 3 that sort of sums up this rather disparate chapter? Because I don't know how you get on with James, but it is disparate, isn't it? We go from one subject to another, then to another, almost without any linkage at all. And I was thinking hard about this as I was doing the ironing. And I came across verse 18 in my mind. And verse 18, to me, is the center verse, although it's the last verse in the chapter. Peacemakers who sow in peace, reap 
a harvest of righteousness. That to me sums up this chapter that we're looking at this morning. So you may be, find that helpful to keep that verse in your mind. So let's look at peace, perfect peace. I think of all of us, we, we want peace in our lives. And I suspect for many parents, the moment when our children are finally in bed, that is the moment when we suddenly feel peace descend particularly over these six weeks of holiday that uh, uh, many of you are having to cope with. So we want peace in our homes. I will say that in our home with Linda and myself, peace reigns most of the time, um, except when we are leaving to go somewhere. Now, the moment we go through the front door is a critical moment in our house because at that moment, as I turn to lock the door, Linda will say, I just need to check where my keys are. Now, this is immediately a downer, and I feel peace begin to disappear uh, almost instantaneously. This is particularly relevant and severe when Linda decides she's going to look in this TARDIS-like handbag and start to rummage in that to see if the keys are there. Usually I give up at this moment, sit down in, in a chair and start to read the paper again because I know uh, things are, are just not going to sort themselves out for long, well, for a long time. So peace really matters. And of course, what James is talking about here is peace in the church. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's keep in mind, although these passages have relevance for us outside of the church, they're specifically aimed at Christians within churches. That's where James is coming from. He is a pastor. He knows what is necessary in church. And so he's working on this word, peace. But is it peace at any price? I just want to go off and swerve in a way to a rather negative area here. Do we as Christians seek peace at any price? And I put it to you that we do not. And I don't think James is saying that we should have peace at any price. For instance, if the gospel is being undermined in a church or in a denomination, as it is in our present day, in some of our historic denominations in this country, if the cross is not any longer in a church front and center in the preaching, and if the Bible and its veracity, its truth, is being undermined in a church or in a denomination, then we cannot have peace. It's as simple as that. We will stand against that sort of erroneous teaching. And if you think that is, uh, to some extent, harsh, then you only have to read the letter of Galatians uh, that Paul wrote to realize how severe he took uh, error and heresy within a church, and how he spoke against it. And there's a verse, of course, which is slightly uncomfortable, of the Lord Jesus himself, who speaks and says this in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 51. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I, I, I tell you, but division. Now, that's an odd word from the Prince of Peace, isn't it? But you see what Jesus is getting at. Truth matters, and we cannot play fast and loose with it. So there is times in a church, and certainly within denominations, when peace cannot reign. And it cannot reign because our central truth of the gospel is being undermined uh, or error is being taught. That, in a way, is why James begins chapter 3 in the way he does, because of the importance of teachers and preachers, that they get it right. They have a huge respons responsibility. But let's leave the negative and get back to where we are with our positive. Peacemakers, says James, who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And so he is calling the church always to seek with one another, that is you and I at Hope Community Church, to be people who seek peace and strive for peace. Did you notice in the reading, and we'll come back to it more thoroughly, but in um, uh, this same chapter, verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And James, being a wise man, puts his finger on where so many problems arise in the church, the lack of humility. 
where people are not humble before the Lord Jesus. And so humility is an issue. But he goes on. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. In other words, he hasn't given a comprehensive um, list of things that can go wrong in the church, but he's picked out three things which have, can be dominant, and he would know as the pastor of a church, and that is the lack of humility, envy, and selfish ambition. I have never understood that. The business of selfish ambition in a church is a continual puzzle to me, because 98% of this country, to be honest, uh, brothers and sisters, don't even care that you go to church. And the fact that you may have status in the church is even less important and more irrelevant to them than anything else. I mean, why people seek um, position in church and have ambition that drives them is completely beyond me. Because it is meaningless to the world out there. And to be honest, it's pretty meaningless within the church as well, as we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, don't we? We are equal in all our work. So, James is saying this is where we need to be careful. And so, this business of being peacemakers is absolutely essential. And it is essential for every one of us. This is not just for leaders, but there is a connection, actually, with verse 1 all the way through this. And you can see it, that leaders and preachers of churches are particularly responsible for peace. We, as leaders, should be people who are prepared, where necessary, to pour oil on troubled waters, where the issues are not gospel issues. And often in churches, the issues that rise up, frankly, are not gospel issues. They're often superficial things, small things that become big. And it is the leader's job to pour oil on those troubled waters and not to be firebrands. Because some leaders can be the ones who stir up things and destroy the peace by being fiery sort of characters uh, and harsh characters. And so uh, James is so specific here that peace matters. At the end of the day, we are the people of the Prince of Peace, and we should be emulating him as that peacemaker, wherever it is possible. But we don't stay there. Uh, we then come uh, to living the life. You know the phrase, don't do as I do, but uh, do as I say which is pretty well what every teacher does. But of course, as Christians, as we sit in, uh, together this morning, that is not good enough. We do not just speak the truth, but we have to live it as well. And that's what James is saying here. And he uses, slightly oddly in a way, uh, the business of wisdom. Did you get that? From verse 13 through to verse 17. He says this, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And now he puts this negatively. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly unspiritual, demonic. That's pretty hard stuff. I, we should be getting used to James by now that he does not mince his words. He is direct and forceful and outspoken, really. And so he is saying we have two types of wisdom here that can operate in the church. What is this wisdom? Well, it's the way we think about how we live our lives how it's clear in our minds how we should be living our lives and the wisdom that enables us to live that life, the life that we are living. And he says there can be a sort of earthly wisdom that's operating in the church and, of course, it is unspiritual. And he even says it can be demonic. It can actually be operating in the church from the devil. And so we have to be careful how we live. And he says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, this is verse 16, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Now, I have to say, when Linda and I were in our first church, we saw something of this. 
And we had, it was an established church of many years, and it had a large congregation and a mixed congregation. Many of the older folk were people who particularly seemed very spiritual and said very spiritual things. But we quickly discovered, um, uh, we were young in those days, that some of the people who seemed to speak the, correctly and say spiritual things could actually be vile in the way they spoke to others. And particularly, I have to say, in our experience, to two pastors who pastored that church. And they were treated, you know, to, to the most terrible things uh, that were said about them. And so James, he knows a thing or two, doesn't he? He knows it seems remote to us. But James knows this is not remote. He's writing to a number of churches. And he's writing from Jerusalem, his own church, which was large. And he's saying, look, this can be true. You, we must be aware that sometimes our behavior and the way we think about our lives can be devilish. It can be destructive. But thankfully, he doesn't give the negative. He could have done, couldn't he, knowing James. He goes on to the positive, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, this is godly wisdom. The godly way of thinking is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Now, when you read those verses, I wonder if another passage of Scripture comes immediately to mind. Not a rhetorical question. <laughs> How about it? I was preaching somewhere else last week, and I did this to the congregation. They were almost in a state of shock that I asked them a question. Anyone, any ideas? Yeah, exactly that. Well done, Stephen. Um, Stephen. Uh, the fruits of the Spirit. And you find that in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I'll just read on. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, that's us, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's what James is talking about, isn't he? This crucifixion, as it were, daily of the passions and desires that grow up in every one of our hearts. Let's be honest. It is a constant battle for us. And this is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what James is talking about. And, of course, there is the clue on how we live wisely with godly wisdom and a godly life. And it is through the power of the Spirit. It's interesting that in the letter of James, he doesn't use much theology, does he? He doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit. I, I don't think the Holy Spirit actually is mentioned in James, but he is there in the background. And here he is, thinking of that fruit of the Spirit that he writes about here in this chapter 3, and uh, about being pure and peace-loving and so on. That is only possible by the power of the Spirit of God, and that's who we need daily. Each day, we need to call upon that Spirit of God to be in us and to fill us, that we might live as we should. But also, of course, the fruit of the Spirit and the, the more reduced fruit that J James talks about in chapter 3 is merely a picture of our Lord Jesus, isn't it? That is our Christ. Even if you take the, the briefer James version, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, that is our Jesus. And of course, the Holy Spirit's job is not to direct attention to himself anyway, but direct attention where? To Jesus. That's what the Spirit does. He is always looking and bringing the spotlight on Christ and saying, look at him. Look at Jesus. If you look at his life, then you'll know what your life should look like as his child. That's how you should be living. And so we then look at Christ in the Gospels and see his beauty and his holiness and his mercy and so on. And that is us. That should be his children. It's as simple as that. But make no mistake, this is a battle. And the battle is either we have this earthly wisdom that continually rises up in our hearts 
or we take on the godly wisdom that the Spirit uh, imbues into his people as we rest in him and give ourselves to him. So, there we are. The, the way we should live our lives. You'll notice I'm doing an obscure thing here. I'm going backwards in chapter 3. We started with the last verse. We'll now go back <laughs> to the first part, uh, which is about our speech, uh, talking the talk. Verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Now, this business of how we speak, uh, the use of our tongues, as James puts it, we've already encountered. And interestingly, it was a passage that I uh, preached on as well. Do you remember verse 19 of chapter 1? My dear brothers and sisters, notice the pastoral heart of James. I mean, when you read James, it's tough, isn't it? He, he comes at us with both barrels, and you think, oh, this is a bit harsh. But actually, you see, he's a pastor. And he says, my brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Um, and he goes on, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And he puts it even more forcefully in verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. That's pretty strong stuff. And it's interesting now, in chapter 3, he speaks from verse 2 all the way through to verse 12 about the way we speak. So the fact that he's spending so much time on this should actually be a warning to us that this actually within the church is quite important. Uh, if nothing else, just by the number of verses that he spends in expounding the business of how we use our tongues. And we know that sp our speech within church, particularly, that's what he's talking about, particularly, can be disastrous. When I worked in Bromley, I, I had a Golf GTI. That's only for people who know what I'm talking about. You don't worry if you don't. But I loved the car. I really loved this car and enjoyed it immensely. And I was driving home quite late at night, actually, from, from where I worked back home, which was only a short journey. And I was stopped by the police. And it was a bit of a shock. And um, he said, you do realize that you were exceeding the speed limit. And I heard myself say, yeah, these cars tend to do that. And as I said it, I thought that was probably a mistake. Um, that was not going to go down well with this, this policeman, who was very polite, I have to say. And just in case you're wondering, I was not booked, okay? He was very polite and just gave me a telling off. And that's the thing, isn't it? it that, that our speech can be disastrous. And how many times have we said something and we just cannot take it back? We want to. And it haunts us, but we've said it. It's gone. It's out there. Conversely, of course, we say the, the, the phrase, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You know that phrase. It's a common one. But it's not true, is it? Words can really hurt. And how many times have people said things to you that you can never, ever forget? You want to, you want to bury it, but you can't. It's gone out there, it's hit you, and it stays in your heart as much as you try to deal with it. So words can be disastrous. And in a church, as I think I said when I preached on the earlier passage in chapter 1, is particularly sensitive issue. And James really does not mince his words, does he? He puts the point that the tongue, although it's the smallest member of our body, um, can have disastrous effects and big effects. And that's why he uses this illustration in verse 3 about bits in the mouths of a powerful horse or a little rudder that guards and guides a ship. And he says about a small spark that sets a great forest ablaze. It's pretty good descriptive language. But the bit that really shook me is the bit verse 9. 
With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, you know how he's working up this, this passion of his for his people. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear frigs, figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And he is touching there the business of hypocrisy, isn't he? where we can be speaking the things of God, we can be singing the things of God that we did this morning and do it sincerely and then out of our mouths can come the things which are displeasing to God and dishonoring to God and dishonoring to God's people and hurtful. The reality is, fitting this together within the whole chapter, if you think about it, our tongue, our speech, will sooner or later show what's going on in our hearts. If our hearts are geared to the earth, earthly wisdom, living in an earthly way, our speech ultimately will display it. As much as we cover it up, it will come out. But if we are living in a godly way, with the power of the Spirit, then our speech will also show it. And so in this chapter, he is saying to you and I, we should be people within church particularly, who should be peace-loving and peace-seeking. Do all we can to pour that oil on troubled waters, which will come. We're all a disparate people, let's face it. We will have times when we disagree and, and hurt unintentionally each other, but we do not allow that to fester. We seek peace within the church and we are people who should be seeking to live for Christ like Christ. And this will be seen in our speech to one another. Think what that would look like to someone who comes in from outside, who lives in the world, who's not encountered Christians or a Christian church before. Think what that would look like to them. They will see something in a church like ours if this is operating as James is urging us, they will see something in a church like ours that they will never see out there. How much peace are people experiencing? How much righteous living are they encountering each day? And what about the language that they hear? And so this has got a huge evangelistic Christ-honoring impetus that James has presented to us this morning.